Let us worship the Lord this evening by singing the hymn 290. 290, come with me, visit Calvary, where our Redeemer died. His blood, it fills the fountain, tis full, tis deep, tis wide. Hymn 290, we will stand while we sing. Just before we bow together in prayer, uh, could I, on behalf of the session and the congregation, extend our heartfelt sympathy uh, to the McGill family circle. Uh, Our sister, Mrs. McGill, uh, passed to be with the Lord this morning, just at about a quarter past 11. And of course, she had been a faithful member of the congregation for many years. In fact, many years, she looked after the flowers uh, here uh, in the church uh, week by week. Uh, The funeral service will be here in the church on Wednesday at 12 noon. Uh, However, there is uh, time 
if you wish to go to Malcolm's funeral uh, there, it will be open on Monday evening from 7 through to 9, have an opportunity to meet uh, the family. But we trust you'll remember that and remember the family circle in your prayers at this uh, time. So let's come to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious God and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for that time when we came to Calvary. We rejoice that there our sins were washed away, and we were accepted by the Beloved. And we ask, Lord, that Thou wouldst keep us ever near the cross. Help us, Lord, to sit beneath its shadow. Help us to see and to learn every day more of what Thou didst do for us, what it meant for Thee, the Son of God, to become our substitute, to bear away our sins. We thank You, Lord, this evening for Thy so great salvation. We thank Thee for that hope that is in our heart, uh, that we are Thine, and one day we shall be with Thee uh, for all of eternity. And Lord, as we gather uh, before Thee this evening, we have been reminded once again even of my, the uh, brittleness of life, how that we are here one moment and my, the next gone. And we ask, Lord, that even that Thou wouldst teach us to number our days and to be ready for that day when Thou dost call us home. We thank You for that day when Mrs. McGill, at a mission many, many years ago, trusted Thee as her own and personal Savior. We thank Thee for her love and our service for Thee. Remember Nat tonight. We remember the boys, remember the daughter, the grandchildren. We ask, Lord, that Thou wouldst draw near to them, put Thine arms of love around them, bear them up in their sorrow, and we pray that they might know Thy help and Thy grace at this most difficult time. Lord, we thank Thee that while we miss her, we rejoice that she is with Thee, which is even far better. And we pray, Lord, undertake. Remember others tonight who are not well. We pray be near to them. Remember the Reverend Whiteside in hospital. Draw near to him. Touch him in body. Remember Mrs. Baird, uh, even at this time as well, so low. We pray be near to her and undertake. Others, Lord, are maybe going through trials and troubles tonight that none of us know about. But we thank Thee, Thou knowest all things. Draw aside uh, to, and meet with them. We thank Thee that Thy grace is sufficient for every situation in life. We thank You, Lord, for drawing us aside tonight into this place, and we pray that You would join with us. We help us to sing Thy praises, help us to hear the Word of God, and we pray, Lord, tonight that our hearts might be spoken to. And if there are those that know Thee not as Savior, we ask, Lord, that Thou wouldst be with them and that Thou would speak to them and that You would draw them this evening to the foot of the old rugged cross. Remember others connected with their congregation who are preaching in other places tonight. We pray, Lord, be with them. Give them power. Give them freedom, that liberty that comes from Thee. Remember her sister Ruth as she will be testifying this evening and Carrie Duff be with her and undertake. And so, Lord, we pray that Thou wouldst be with us now this evening. Pour out Thy Spirit upon us. Refresh our souls and encourage us. For Jesus' sake, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. We're turning to our hymn books again. We're turning to the hymn uh, number 70. Uh, the hymn number 70. Immortal, honor, immortal honors rest in Jesus' head. My God, my portion and my living bread. The hymn number 70, and we will stand while we sing.
We're turning in our Bibles this evening to the New Testament, to the Gospel according to Matthew, and the chapter 13, the Gospel of Matthew, and the chapter 13. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, and we have, of course, in this chapter, uh, several parables spoken by the Lord, and we're breaking into the chapter at the verse 36. Matthew 13, verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathereth, gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Amen. And we pray that God will take his own precious word and that he write it even upon our hearts. At this stage, we're going to ask our brother, Mr. Todd, to come and to make the announcements for the incoming week. Well, good evening, everyone. You're very welcome along to our gospel service tonight. It's good to see you out at God's house. May the Lord bless each one of us as we meet around his word here tonight. A very warm welcome to you who have joined with us online in our Savior's name. Just like to remind you of the various meetings that are upcoming. First of all, starting with our midweek meeting on Tuesday, that's at 8 p.m. You're invited out to the Tuesday night meeting, one and all. And God willing, this week, our own minister, the Reverend Murray, will be the speaker at that meeting. The Beeline Children's Meeting is on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And we'd like to invite all the boys and girls to come along to the meeting. One of our own members, Mr. Aaron for Simons, will be the speaker this week. The final Beeline Children's Meeting for the session will take place here in the church on Wednesday the 27th of March, also at 7 p.m. The guest speaker on that occasion will be Miss Christina Logan, who is a children's evangelist. In connection with that meeting, we would like to make an appeal for extra help from the congregation. And we would appreciate the help of the ladies with catering and the serving of supper, and also some of the men folk for help too with serving the supper getting visitors seated on car park duties. And if you are available to help, there is a list sitting on the hall table. Do please fill your name in on that list if you haven't already done so. Next Lord's Day, the Sunday School and Bible class will be at the usual time of half past ten, services at half past eleven and seven o'clock, and times of prayer in the committee room before each service. Just a reminder that the Sunday School Superintendent, Mr. Samuel Dummigan, has appealed for more female helpers to supervise the children on bus routes to and from the Sunday School. 
Any uh, assistance in that regard would be appreciated as there is a shortage of helpers at the present time. Please do see Mr. Dummigan if you can give us your time to assist in that manner. Next Sunday, there will be a youth fellowship meeting following the evening service, and that is at quarter past eight. Next Lord's Day is also Let the Bible Speak Sunday, and baskets will be left at the door for a retiring offering for that work. The graduation of the Christian Workers' Training Academy will be this Thursday, that's the 21st of March, in Tandragee Free Presbyterian Church, and that's at 8 p.m. The preacher is our Whitfield College principal, the Reverend Timothy Nelson, and supper will be provided following that meeting. The course director of the Christian Workers' Training Academy, that's the Reverend Julian Patterson, says that it has been an encouraging year since the Academy recommenced last October, and there are 33 individuals who have completed the course this year. The graduation will be of special interest to those who have members of their church who are graduating on Thursday. The next Friendship Corner will be held on Thursday week, that is the 28th of March, and the guest speaker on that occasion will be the Reverend Fred Greenfield. Sunday the 31st of March will be our next Family and Friends service, and we'd like you to join with us to hear personal words of testimony from Cumber Farmer, Mr. John Hamilton, and his wife Gemma, who experienced deep trials in their lives after John was involved in a road traffic accident in 2019. Learn how God used this accident and its consequent serious implications to John's health to challenge their perceptions of family, farming, and faith. And if you can come along to that meeting, you'd be most welcome to join with us. And finally, on Tuesday night past, we had a deputation meeting. Mr. Noel Shields was along, speaking about the work that he does here in Northern Ireland. And the offering on that occasion came to £490, and would like to thank you for your continued support for all our missionary uh, workers. These are all the announcements. Thank you. We'll turn to hymn 401 while you're finding the place. Uh, could I say that we will have one uh, from our own congregation graduating uh, at the Christian Workers at Training Academy on Thursday night over in Tandragee, uh, so you'd be very welcome uh, to go along and to support that meeting. I had the privilege many, many years ago of setting up the Christian Workers Training Academy, and when we set it up, we thought, that, well, it might go for four years or five years, but that's many years, and it's still going on, and it's good to see that there's over 30 graduating uh, this year. So you'd be very welcome along there in Tandragee on Thursday evening. The hymn 401, in land or store I may be poor, my place unknown, my name on school. And we'll keep our seats while the offering is being lifted.
We're turning in our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. And with our Bibles open, we'll bow together in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the words that we have been singing. We thank Thee that in Christ there are treasures, treasures beyond measure. And let so many don't see it, And we pray for that work of the Spirit of God who opens man's understanding. Oh, that tonight that they might see that their lives are poor without thee. And that they might possess that greatest of all possessions. Lord, to that end I ask thee for help. Oh, that thy word would speak this evening. That faith would be born in hearts. To that end bring to my mind what thou would have us to say. We know the devil is the great distractor. He would be here to snatch away the thoughts, the mind, to other things. But Lord, tonight defeat him. And we pray that thy word might run and that it might have free course this evening. So hear our prayer and be our portion, for we ask these things in thy name and for thy glory. Amen. Amen. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. I want to draw your attention to one of the shortest of the parables in this portion. It's just one verse, Matthew chapter 13. And the Lord said in the verse 44, And again the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. As we come into this chapter, we find the Lord speaking in parables. In fact, on this occasion, we're told in verse 34, that without a parable spake he not unto them. And in verse 44, telling the parable of the hidden treasure, he introduces us to a poor tenant farmer. From the context, it seems that his own land not being sufficient to meet his needs and his family's needs, he was forced to rent another field. He plowing it, or perhaps by digging a drain, his spade suddenly hit something solid. On farther investigation, my, he, uh, he found it to be some type of metal container. And in great anticipation, he opening it up, he found inside a considerable treasure. In those days, finding a treasure buried in the field was not really that unusual. There were no banks, and more than that, Palestine was a place of continual conflict. And as people, seeing the battle on the horizon, they going into their homes, they gathered up their most prized possessions, they took them outside, and they dug a hole, and they buried them there with every intention when my, the battle would pass of digging them up and bringing them back into their own home. And this man, finding this treasure, he selling all that he had, he claimed it to be his own. Why? Because he knew it would be sufficient to pay off all his debts. And more than that, it would be sufficient to provide all that he would need in the years and months that would lie ahead. And you see, like this treasure, the gospel is not only saving, but it is sufficient. It is sufficient to pay off the debt of our sin. And more than that, it is sufficient to provide for our every need in the future. Indeed, the Apostle Paul, assuring the Philippian believers of this, he said in Philippians 4, verse 19, My God shall supply all your need. The word supply there is elsewhere translated some 19 times as fill. And it literally means to fill right up to the top. In other words, he was reminding them that the Lord was able to completely fill or he was able to satisfy them. You see, saving the soul, the Lord is able to satisfy the soul. There is in him grace not only for today, but there is grace for tomorrow. Someone has said, we're all part of the problem, but there is only one who is the solution. His name is Jesus. 
in the Lord. Jesus Christ is the only answer. My friend, what is the need of your heart this evening? Is it pardon? Is it peace? Is it my joy? I tell you that Christ is that great treasure, and if only you find him, he is able to supply your every need. He's able to fill your heart, and he's able to fill it until it flows over. He is a treasure, a great treasure. And I wonder tonight, have you found him? Have you found the treasure of salvation? And so I want tonight, just for a short time, to consider this parable. Firstly, I want you to notice the stone mentioned here. While we're not told what this treasure was, it probably was a precious stone. The fact that he was willing to sell all that he had in order to purchase indicates that it was of great value. But you notice here its position. We read in verse 44, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. We are told here that this treasure was located in a field. In fact, the field is mentioned in two of the previous parables. The Lord there explaining its meaning. He said in verse 38, the field is the world. But while this treasure was located in a field or in the world, we are told here that it was hidden or it was out of sight. Had it not been so, my, the owner would never, he would never have agreed to sell the field. In fact, it was only discovered when this man began to dig deep down into the soil. It was a treasure. It was in the field, but it was hidden. It was hidden from view. And you know, like this treasure, the gospel, while it is heralded, it is hidden. Left to himself, without any effort, man will never discover it. Indeed, writing to the Corinthians who prided themselves in their great intellectual ability, Paul bursting their bubble, he said in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And Satan, ensnaring them, he had blinded them. In other words, he had so shrouded their minds in darkness that although they sat under the ministry of some of the greatest preachers that ever preached in this world, yet they could still see no beauty in Christ that they would desire him. You see, it's not that there is no beauty in Christ, but it is man in his natural position is blind to that beauty. It is hidden from his natural view. You know, back in July 2010, a metal detector enthusiast found one of the biggest hordes of Roman coins in, an ear, in a field near Fromm in Somerset. Within an earthen jar, there were 52,000 coins worth £3.3 million. Pounds. It's believed that the coins dated back to the third century. For 18 centuries, men were walking over those coins. They were walking over the treasure, but they didn't know that it was there. My, without a searching, without the metal detector, my, this man would never, never have found them. And you see, if you're ever going to find that greatest of all treasures, then you need to search for it. If you only look upon the surface, you will find no beauty in Christ that you should ever desire Him. You see, like this man, you need to dig down through your prejudices. You need to dig down into the Word of God. And my, if only you take time and you search the Scriptures, now you'll find the treasure. You'll find the Savior. You will find His so great salvation. And as such, I would urge you this evening, my, to dig down, to dig down. Not only His position, but we notice His preciousness. 
He said in verse 44, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. He calls it here a treasure. And in desiring to possess this treasure, he going home, he put his land, his barns, and his house up for sale. In fact, we're told here that he selleth all that he hath. He kept nothing back from the auctioneer's mallet. In other words, this man suddenly realized that this treasure was worth more than his house. It was worth more than his cattle. It was worth more than his field. You see, this treasure, it possessed a great value. And while the gospel of Christ is given without price, yet it is beyond price. It is a treasure that is greater than any other treasure. In fact, in his epistles, the apostle Paul uses the word riches in reference to the various facets of the gospel. He talks about the riches of His grace, the riches of His mercy, and he talks about the riches of His love. He writing to the Ephesian believers, he said in Ephesians 3, verse 8, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The word unsearchable there simply means past finding out or impossible to comprehend. In other words, he was indicating here that Christ was such a rich possession that no matter how much they searched, they could never discover all the treasures that are in him. You see, the Savior and salvation are not a poor possession, but they are a rich possession. They are worth more than gold. By the once slave trader, John Newton, being converted, speaking later in his life, he said, my memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. And can I add this evening, he offers to you a great salvation. It is a treasure beyond price, so much, so precious that the martyrs were willing to lay down their lives than to give up this treasure. You see, this salvation is worth more than gold. It's worth more than promotion. It's worth more than fame. My friend, it is the greatest possession that you could ever, ever possess. And as such, I would say to you tonight, sell all. My, give up every alliance. Give up everything. My, but embrace this salvation. It's the greatest treasure. It's the greatest treasure that you could ever, my, possess. Not only the stone mentioned here, but we notice the search mentioned here. Whether he was plowing or digging a well, we're not told. However, he discovering this treasure, he was not content just to look at it, but you notice that there was here a pursuing of the treasure, as well as digging down into the field and finding it. We read at the end of verse 44, the which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Notice that in finding this treasure, he hid it. And then putting it back into the ground and covering it up. Some think that he was unethical, and that he was trying to pull a fast one on the owner of the land. However, that is to misunderstand the laws of that day. Jewish rabbinical law stated, if a man finds scattered fruit or money, it belongs to the finder. And as such, this man finding this treasure, it rightly belonged to him. However, lest someone would raise a query over his ownership, he went and sold all that he had, and he went out and he bought the field. You see, he was determined. He was determined in his heart that he would, he would make this treasure 
his own. And by there was here a seeking, a seeking to own and possess it. And if you are tonight to possess the greater treasure of salvation, there needs not merely to be a pondering of it, but there needs to be a pursuing of it, a seeking to make it your own, a seeking of it with all of your heart. Indeed, the prodigal son, realizing that the wor- this world with all its glitter was but emptiness, he desiring to sit and eat at his father's table, he said in Luke 15, verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And while his father was standing, looking out, waiting, yet this man, he had to rise up and he had to come. He had to come to his father. You see, as well as coming to your senses, you need to come to the Savior. There needs to be a rising up and my seeking him with all of your hearts. Sometimes people imagine that all that is necessary is for salvation is to give up your sin. My friend, give up your sin and I have no doubt you'll become a better person. But you will never, never become a forgiven person. You see, as well as turning from your sin, there needs to be a seeking, a a seeking of the Savior, just as this man sought the treasure and would not stop until he could say, it's mine. So you need to seek the Savior. You need to seek Him with all of your heart. Maybe you've left some of your sins, but that is not enough. You need to come to the Savior. You need to seek Him. You need to seek Him with all of your heart this evening. Not only was there a pursuing, but you notice there was a a purchasing of this treasure. Discovering His treasure and desiring it, we read at the end of verse 44, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field desiring this treasure. No price was too high, and no sacrifice was too great. In his book on the parables, William Taylor says of this man, he did not go round whimpering about the sacrifice he was making or the self-denial he was practicing. He gave up much. He willingly gave up everything that he possessed in order to possess this treasure. You see, it was now more important to him than his cattle. It was now more important to him than even his family. You see, tonight there is nothing more important than your soul's salvation. And if you are to possess it, you must, like this man, be willing to forsake to give up everything. Indeed, the Lord said in Mark chapter 9, verse 45, And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. The Lord here was not my speaking literally, but he was speaking metaphorically. And in the following verses, he also mentions there the cutting of the foot and the gouging out of the eye. In other words, he was telling them that it was better for them to lose anything, anything, no matter how dear or how precious, than to lose their soul. You see, your soul is more important than your wealth, and your soul is more important than your health. Better to lose your silver, better to lose your standing than to lose your soul. My the lobster getting caught by its claw, it doesn't hesitate. It knowing that if it doesn't escape, it's going to the pot. My, it simply, my, uh, severs its claw and on it goes. And I would say to you tonight, better to lose anything than to lose your soul's salvation. 
I wonder tonight, even as you sit in this meeting, my friend, what's hindering you? Oh, you know in your heart that God's salvation is a treasure. You know that it's something that is good to have. But there's something, there's something in your life, and it's stopping you. Then, like this man, sell all. Give up everything. Better to lose everything than to lose your soul. Than to lose your soul for all of eternity. This man, my, he found the treasure, and nothing was going to stop him possessing it. But not only the search, but I want you to notice also the success mentioned here. He purchasing this field, he then returned to claim the treasure as his own. And gazing upon it, you notice here his happiness. Finding this treasure, we read at the end of verse 44. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Why the possessing of this treasure cost him, and it cost him dearly, yet we find that he had no regrets, and he had no remorse. Rather, we are told here that he did it with joy. And the word joy here speaks of gladness. And despite all the seeming sacrifice and hardship and no doubt opposition from family and opposition from friends, yet there was joy. There was joy in his heart. My finding the treasure, there was now in his heart a deep-seated joy a real joy. And you see, with God's salvation, there always comes a song, a joy that even the troubles and trials of life cannot remove. Indeed, in the Acts of the Apostles, we read there of the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And he finding the treasure of salvation, we read in Acts 8, 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. He was heading home to a land that was steeped in idolatry. My, there was every possibility that going home he would find opposition, that going home that he could even be put to death for his new found faith. And yet, finding the treasure, he went home rejoicing. There was joy in his heart. You see, with God's deliverance, there comes delight. A joy that remains not only in the day, but a joy that remains in the night. You say, preacher, do you mean if I get saved tonight, I'll never have another problem? I'll never have another difficulty? No, that's not what I'm saying tonight. My Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, and he had nothing but trouble. My, we find him going up into the city of Philippi and preaching the gospel. He was arrested. He was beaten. And yet, my, we find him there at midnight singing. You see, the man in this parable was not rejoicing in his circumstances. He was rejoicing in his treasure. And if, my friend, you keep your eyes upon Christ you'll have joy. You'll have joy. My, it'll bring all of your troubles. It'll bring all of your problems. It'll bring all of your ailments into perspective. The little chorus said, if you want joy, real joy, let Jesus come into your heart. And tonight, if only you let Christ come into your heart, my, you'll find joy. Yes, there'll be troubles. Yes, there'll be problems. But my, you'll be able to rejoice in your treasure. You'll be able to rejoice in your salvation, in your Savior, in the fact that you're going to heaven. Oh, how happy was this man. He'd got a good deal, a good bargain. Not only his happiness, but notice his helpfulness. While he sold everything, yet rather than being the poorer for it, he became richer. He he gained a a far, far greater treasure. 
And he now, possessing this treasure, he would have been in a better position to help his neighbors and to help those around him. You see, God's salvation not only fills our cup, but it fills our cup until it flows over. It enables us to help even others. Solomon said in Proverbs 10, verse 21, the lips of the righteous feed many. My friend, you want to help others. You want to be a blessing to others. Then take this treasure. Take this treasure of salvation. And my, it will fill your heart and it will thrill your heart. Then finally, I want you to notice there was a sequel mentioned here. Discovering this treasure, notice there was a prizing of the stone. When a man finds a treasure, and especially a treasure he has given up all to possess, he treasures it. Can't we see this man holding this stone in his hand, admiring every facet of it in the light of the sun or in the light of a candle in his own home? And you see, rather than being disappointed, this man, he was thrilled. He was thrilled with his discovery. It was his chief joy. In fact, it became, it became his only joy. And my friend, going out, finding this treasure, selling all to buy the field, he didn't come home and say to his wife, I made a bad bargain. No, no, he knew it was a good bargain. It filled his heart with joy. And similarly, Christ is no disappointment. If only you come and take him tonight as your Savior, your heart will be thrilled. You'll not go home with regrets. You'll not go home saying, I have made a bad decision. Those other things, rather than being diamonds, have just become paste. And you'll go home saying, it was the best decision the best decision I ever made. I want to tell you, my friend, I trusted Christ many years ago. I walked many roads, but I have no regrets. I found a treasure that night greater than any treasure. And if you come to Christ, you'll not be disappointed. I think also there was a protecting of this stone. This stone being precious, there would have been many my who would have been envious, many who would have been jealous. There would have been those who said, we'll spoil his treasure. There are those who would have said, we'll try and to steal his treasure. And in hiding the treasure, he was not so much hiding that which he had found or that which he possessed, but he was now protecting it. He was seeking to guard it. And possessing God's salvation, there needs then to be a protecting of it, a guarding of it against those who would seek to stain it and seek to spoil it. You see, if you get saved tonight, I have absolutely no doubt if you never knew there was a devil, you will suddenly know there's a devil. And the devil will come and the devil will whisper in your ear and he'll tell you that salvation is not real. You go to work tomorrow and there will be those who will attack you. And so, my friend, finding God's salvation as this man covered the treasure in order to protect it, you need to guard your salvation. You need to guard it with prayer. You need to surround it with Scripture. You need to build walls of protection around it. My, it is a treasure. It is a treasure beyond my description. And tonight, that's what Christ offers you. The world looks out, and the world, my, portrays salvation as something that is dotty, something that is worthless. But I tell you tonight, it's a jewel, a jewel that was purchased at great price. It's the greatest of all treasures. Missionary Jim Elliot once wrote, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep 
to gain what he cannot lose. And he went on to give up his life to bring the gospel to others. And I tell you tonight, there is no greater treasure than God's salvation. And I would say to you tonight, possess it. This man seeing it, this man seeing my, its value, that he left no stone unturned. He sold all that he had. He was going to have it. He needed to have it. He would have it. And I trust and pray tonight, if you're not saved, that God would put that same determination in your heart, that you would say, tonight I must have it. That you would say, I will not leave this house tonight until I do have it. My friend, is a treasure. It's a treasure beyond description. It's a treasure beyond price. And I would urge you tonight to find it and to possess it and not to stop until you can say, it's mine, it's mine. I have found Christ and I have found his so great salvation. Here's a treasure. My friends, seek it tonight. Don't leave until you find it. We're going to close our service by singing together the words of the hymn to 187 depths of mercy, can there be mercy still reserved for me? Can my God his wrath forbear me the chief of sinners spared? And praise God, my, there is mercy for you if only you come this evening. We'll stand while we sing this closing hymn.
our gracious God and eternal Heavenly Father, our cry would be that Thou would show Thy hand, show Thy wounds to those who are yet outside of Thee. May they see the depths of love that Thou hadst to redeem fallen men. And we pray tonight that they might seek Thee and find that pearl beyond price and leave this place knowing that they are rich, rich indeed, having found Christ. So, Lord, we ask that thou would part us now with thy blessing. Take us to our homes in safety. Watch over us and keep us. For we pray in thy name and for thy glory. Amen. Amen.